Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you? Don't you want to become a cult leader? Hello and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. As always, special thanks to some of my patrons, John, my girl Judy, David, Bree, Brandy, Cassandra, Galen, Gabrielle, Emily, Emma, Nanette, Sophie, Sarah, Teresa, Florence, Robert, Katarina, Hammer, Janice, Freddie, Sam, Arcadia, and Catherine. Thank you so, so much. You are truly appreciated. So today's podcast will be on the Australian cult, The Family. Now, I must say that when there was information available, it was detailed and great. But when it was spotty, it was tough to get organized in an easily understandable timeline. I've done my best to get it all organized. And as with any cult, there is a cult leader and the leader of the family was a woman named Anne Hamilton Byrne. So let's start with her. Anne was actually born Evelyn Grace Victoria Edwards on December 30th 1921 in Sale, Victoria, Australia, which is just east of Melbourne. But I will just continue to call her Anne to save on confusion. So let's also get into some history for that time. In 1921, the Irish Free State was created as Southern Ireland. The Irish Republic issued their Declaration of Independence from the United Kingdom. Also this year, which we've heard a lot more about in our current year, the Tulsa Race Massacre took place. It involved the implementation of Jim Crow laws, which enforced racial segregation and disenfranchisement of black citizens. Also this year, a memorial for unidentified soldiers killed in World War I was created, what we now know as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Also this year, the USSR and Poland agreed to the Treaty of Riga, which established a permanent border between the two countries. Another treaty this year was the Treaty of Berlin between the US and Germany. Now keep in mind, this was the end of World War I. There was also a great famine in Russia due to the failure of crops, which forced some people to do well, the unthinkable, once they became truly starving. And finally, New York Yankee pitcher Babe Ruth hit his 138th home run this year, breaking the career home run record that had been held by Roger Connor for 23 years. So back to Anne, her father was Ralph Edwards from Melbourne, born in 1892. He, like so many others, had left Australia to go to Europe to fight in World War I, and when he returned home, he married. It was noted that he had had a wife prior to the marriage to the woman who would be Anne's mother, but I couldn't find out who it was. So Anne's mother was Florence Hoyle, who had been from London, England. Florence spent more time in mental asylums than she did out. She was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. One story stated that Florence had even set her own hair on fire. She also claimed that she was a medium and a psychic who was able to communicate with the dead. So after they married, Ralph and Florence moved to Sale where he would work as an engine cleaner for the railways. Her father traveled from place to place, and rumor has it that he was actually running from unpaid war veterans' debt, but I suspect he was also running from a very unhappy home life. As we know, her mother was quite mentally ill, but the couple still managed to have seven children, the oldest being Anne. 
But with her father all but missing and her mother usually in an institution, this left the children in the old Brighton orphanage. In 1929, it was documented that eight-year-old Anne had been enrolled at the Sunshine Primary School in Melbourne. There is a gap in the records as found by researchers Chris Johnston and Rosie Jones, the authors of the book, quote, The Family, during the 1930s, and it is believed that the other children were born, and she, Anne, was most likely tasked with being the mother of her six younger siblings. And that's when they were actually home and not in the orphanage. Her childhood was mostly made up of parental abandonment, unstable family life, and extreme poverty. However, she would later go on to say that her mother was descended from French royalty, was psychic, and had studied under a spiritual teacher, and that her father was an inventor and rubbed elbows with the elite, and that she had grown up in a, quote, grand mansion with massive grounds, unquote. And, of course, none of this was true. After primary school, she went on to the Furbank Girls' Grammar School, which was a private Anglican day and boarding school in Brighton, Victoria. It was, and apparently still is, a Christian private school where the girls live on campus. There is a separate school for boys. There's really no concrete information about her years as a teenager, though I think it is reasonable to assume she continued going to school and did the best she could considering her less than ideal circumstances. And so while it's not much, that's what we have in terms of her childhood. So let's take a quick look. Here we have a child whose father was sometimes in, but mostly out of the picture. She had a severely mentally ill mother who suffered with schizophrenia and could not be there for her children as she was in and out of mental hospitals throughout their childhoods. This left the children having to live in orphanages at times. And at other times, it is said that Anne had to tend her younger siblings herself, forcing her to take on the mother role that she shouldn't have had to take on, but also leaving her feeling that she had no control over anything in her life. Now, children who experience this kind of childhood abandonment and upheaval and sometimes neglect, where the predictability and comfort of scheduled life points and parental responsibilities simply aren't there, well, they suffer greatly from a great many terrible things, attachment issues, mental health issues, and so on. So as many of us could imagine, she most likely daydreamed of having a family of her own, a husband who would absolutely adore her, was enamored with her, and would never abandon her. She would be the central figure who got the most attention and eventually several children who were perfectly well-behaved. She would nearly symbolize Christ within her imagined future family. Clearly, we know she basically achieved that. So in 1941, Anne officially changed her name from Evelyn to Anne Hamilton and went on to marry a man named Lionel Harris. She was now 20 years old. Lionel was 24 and he was in the army. It is said that while he was stationed away from home, he went AWOL, which basically means he left the base without permission and ran away for nearly eight months. And keep in mind, this was during World War II. Now, during this time, they had a daughter they named Judith, who was born in 1943. The girl would later change her name to Natasha, but more on that later. She would also be the only biological child that Anne would ever have. So eventually, Lionel was caught and arrested by military police once they found him back in Victoria with Anne. He was taken back to base and served another full year in the military before being discharged on what they called compassionate grounds due to extenuating personal circumstances. He took a job as a car salesman and the couple decided to adopt another baby. In 1955, after the adoption had been set up and everything was good to go, Lionel was driving to Sydney to pick up the infant boy when he was involved in a serious car accident. 
he was unfortunately killed. Anne at this point was 34 years old. Natasha was just 12. Notwithstanding her grief for the loss of her husband, she was also told that she no longer qualified to adopt the baby. That same year, Anne discovered that her father had recently died, so she was really devastated all around. At some point soon after, Anne took up yoga and met a woman named Margaret Segesman. I hope I didn't butcher that. Gita is what she was known as, and she was born in 1905 in Switzerland. And she had contracted tuberculosis in 1921 at 16 years old and got treatment in a Swiss Alps sanatorium where she remained for six years. Now, Gita's significance was that while she was in the sanatorium, she became greatly interested in breathing techniques and then developed into a further expansion of consciousness. She was actually fortunate enough to meet the Carl Jung in the 20s, and she discussed these issues with him. He actually suggested she begin doing yoga and studying the yogic philosophies. From there, she developed her own progressive yoga relaxation techniques that she taught in her classes. Once she recovered, she went to Paris for a time. She smuggled refugees into Switzerland during World War II, then stayed in India for a time and studied under gurus at the Tibetan border and even lived in a cave and meditated after she moved to Melbourne. So it is important to note that during this time in the late 50s and early 60s, Eastern philosophies and mysticism were becoming all the rage. The band, The Beatles, took a trip to India to take part in a transcendental meditation training course. It was the very beginnings of the hippie movement. So when Gita began teaching yoga classes, Anne signed right up and she nearly immediately felt renewed. Gita and Anne got along well, but Anne introduced herself as a physiotherapist and a nurse, which of course was not true. But after only a few months, Gita asked Anne to leave her classes because she had, quote, put a spell on a fellow student, end quote. At least that is how it was told. What actually happened was that she had a disagreement with a man in the group. Someone heard her mutter that he would not be in class the next day, that he would be very sick except the man was sick the very next day. So Gita asked her to leave, but this left an impression on some of the other students. So Anna went on to teach yoga herself, and it didn't take her long to begin gathering a devoted following in the yoga community. And she was especially very good at drawing in wealthy middle-aged women to come to her classes. It was said that many of the women were at an age where their children were grown up. Some husbands who were having affairs, and back then, people didn't get divorced as readily as they do now. But what people really began to resonate with was what they described as her clear spiritual power. They felt that, especially after what had happened to the man in Gita's class, Anne had some kind of magical influence over other people's well-being, whether that be positive or negative. She spoke of doing long periods of heavy meditation where she channeled, quote, demonic spiritual power to control and influence the lives of others to bend them to her own will that's proved to be inspired from the pit of hell, end quote. What she was doing was blending Christianity with elements of the occult, Hinduism, and a few other religions and saying that, in principle, spiritual truths are universal. She consulted astrologers and introduced Ouija boards into the mix. The people who began to follow her and her new teachings absolutely adored her. Former followers state that she was an excellent teacher that she was wonderful and really filled a place inside of them that they had felt was empty. She would tell them, quote, 
It is very important and rather advisable for any individual who is midway through their physical incarnation to sever their ties with old things that they do by erecting a new home which will contain new facilities and furnishings which are symbolic of new life powers and blessings and beauties into which you have consciously entered." End quote. Another quote, there's no ifs or buts in that at all. Also remember making changes like that are going to involve human and financial sacrifice, but it is a small price to pay. Remember for the fullness of the benefit to be gained by living in agreement with what you know. What must come to you before anything else are the imperishable gifts of the divine spirit through your training. End quote. Sounds like she's about to ask for their money. And then another quote. I know a tremendous effort has to be made to break the old habits of fear and all the holding back of the self and the false economies. Where you are now is like a season. It is a season of your unfoldment." End quote. So the next player in this story is Rainer Carey Johnson. He was born in 1901 in Leeds, England. He was 19 years older than Anne. He was raised quite religious and earned his master's degree at the University of Oxford. He then went on to earn his PhD in physics at the University of London. At Queen's College, he lectured on natural philosophy in the later 20s and published scientific works on spectroscopy, which is the relationship between matter and electromagnetic radiation, to put it kind of simply. He then became the Masters of Queen's College, University of Melbourne in 1934, which was most unusual because he was not a clergyman. He stayed with this job until he retired in 1964. During all of this, Rayner became quite fascinated in parapsychology, which is the study of mental phenomena which are excluded from or inexplicable by orthodox scientific psychology, such as hypnosis, telepathy, near-death experiences, and so on. He connected himself with the Society for Psychical Research. They were a nonprofit organization and their stated purpose was to understand events and abilities most commonly described as psychic or paranormal. Again, during this time in the 60s, this was really all the rage. During his life, he had a wife, Mary, who also held a master's degree in science from the University of London, and they had two young daughters. Rayner had also apparently published several books on mysticism and parapsychology during the 50s and the 60s as well. His beliefs and published writings did create concern with the Methodist Church, which was some of the reason that he retired from his post as the master. He had also visited India, where he met Indian philosophers and mystics and lectured on spirituality. Rayner very much believed in the philosophy of Imaginism. Now, I read into this, and it's interesting to say the least. To try to sum it up, because I know most of you will want to know what Imaginism is, English philosopher Edward Douglas Fawcett, who has a wholly interesting past in and of himself, was a science fiction author but studied Buddhism, esoteric religious movements, and on and on. He really was an incredibly fascinating person himself. But anyway, Edward's philosophy centered mainly on the idea that our human imagination was the actual reality of the universe. Imaginismists believe that supreme power that created the universe is all imagination. Man is all imagination, and this supreme power that they have labeled as God exists within man and man within it. There's more, but you get the very low-level basic idea. Rayner was a firm believer in this idea. Needless to say, he was an incredibly educated man with a deeper curiosity and a drive to understand things that are otherwise unexplainable. And he felt that he had been called to these types of studies by the unknown beyond. Okay? Okay. Okay. 
So again, he was also described as very kind-hearted, a very good, typical British gentleman. So he owned some property outside of Melbourne called Santa Nicotin. I'm sure I mispronounced that, but it basically means abode of peace. There on his property, he hosted frequent gatherings revolving around religion and philosophy. And guess who led these? None other than Anne. So by this point, Anne is 40 years old. She had made good money being a yoga teacher and so on. She had been using some of her money to get plastic surgery to make herself look younger. She bleached her hair pale blonde or sometimes wore white blonde wigs. She stayed out of the sun, which definitely gave her great skin. She had gray blue eyes, described as having a medium figure, all around stated as a beautiful, stunning woman. At this point, Rayner was 61. So in 1962, just before Christmas, there was a ring at his door. He was in his study and the rest of the family was in the kitchen working on dinner. Someone answered the door and there stood Anne. She introduced herself to Rayner by saying, quote, I don't think you know me, Rayner, but I know you well. My name is Anne. I understand you are shortly going on a visit to India, end quote. He replied that yes, he and his wife, Mary, were scheduled to take a six week trip lecturing on science and spirituality. He was actually quite surprised that this strange woman who didn't really know him would know of his travel plans. But you see, that's what she did. She dug for information about people. She then used it to her advantage. In fact, she was already developing a very loyal following by this point, which included two men that worked at Queens College, and they were most likely telling her what she wanted to know. One was John Champness, who was a psychologist and friend of Anne's. The other was Michael Riley, who Anne would eventually go on to marry in 1965, though the marriage only lasted one year. As Anne and Rayner chatted in his study, he realized that they both were very interested in Helena Blavatsky, who was a Russian medium and helped to form the Theosophical Society in New York in 1875. Theosophical meaning divine wisdom. And again, that is yet another philosophical rabbit hole that I can explore with you if you would like. If you want me to plug into that for you guys, I'll be happy to do it. Just let me know. And they had many other interests in common as well. Anne told him about how she had made the people in her classes, and let's be honest, her followers read about other gurus that Rayner also held in high regard. Needless to say, Rayner was excited about his new acquaintance. Now, after her rather impressive, you know, razzle dazzle, she then warned him to keep an eye on his wife, Mary's health while they were gone in India. She told him that she could, quote, see there is danger there, end quote. Rayner called for his wife to join him into the study where Anne told Mary that she would become ill during their trip and they'd have to return home early. Now, Rayner later wrote about this first meeting, saying that he instantly suspected she had extrasensory perception. Well, as luck would have it, though quite unfortunate for Mary, she did develop acute dysentery while gone and they were forced to return to Australia early. Mary got very ill, in fact, and it took her quite some time to get back to healthy, just as Anne had predicted. And just like that, she had her first completely devoted societal high-ranking follower. Rayner wrote in his diary, quote, It is scarcely necessary to say that upon our return in February 1963, the person we were most looking forward to seeing again was Anne. It was for us the beginning of a friendship in which weekly visits were interchanged between our homes and wonder deepened, end quote. They created a group they initially called the Great White Brotherhood, which was eventually changed to the family. In 
And then tragedy struck. Anne's daughter, Judy, who was 19 years old at this point, was involved in a horrible car accident, much like her father had, and she suffered a double compound fracture to the base of her skull, which could have easily killed her. A surgeon that Rayner happened to be acquainted with was attending her and stated her outlook was pretty grave. Anne quickly put together a group who meditated and prayed, asking for help from spirits to help her daughter. And two days later, Judy was miraculously sitting up in bed, vital readings all normal. A week after that, she was released from the hospital. Rayner wrote in his journal that Anne was, quote, the most Christ-like person I have ever met, end quote. And then things began developing rather quickly. He was asked to retire his position as master at Queens College because he began rejecting the divinity of Christ, becoming fully immersed in recruiting the high standing members of Melbourne's society, giving speeches about spirituality and the paranormal, pointing them all to Anne. Rainer, Mary, and one of their own young daughters, along with four other followers, began taking hallucinogens where they all, quote, recognized Anne as Jesus. And I believe that's going to be it for part one. So stay tuned next week and we will have part two, getting into the actual cult activities of the family. Thank you for watching.